Well, today I'm going to bring you back in time. I'm going to bring you back to December 17th, 1945. That was known as the greatest train wreck that Red Wing had ever seen. But before we get started, I've got to set the stage just a little bit so you know where we're at and what was happening. So this happened at 6.35 in the morning. It was a Monday. Now remember, I don't know what it is about where you live, but here at 6.35 in the morning, it's pretty dark. And the temperature that day was six below zero. So at 6.35 in the morning, we're probably talking just under or just above zero. And the high for that day was supposed to be two above, about three o'clock. So I'm gonna set the stage here, dress warm. I don't want you to get frostbite. And uh, we'll see where that crash happened and I'll tell you the story. Well, I came down here to the depot uh, a little early this morning at 6.30 on my clock. And I'm gonna walk out there and I'm going to video that area where the accident happened at 6.35 because that's when it happened. And <laughs> when I do my research, I have, to, I have to look at everything and I have to feel things. So I need to see what it looked like at 6.35. So I'm gonna head out. So this is the area of the accident. There is a light behind me. Um, that wouldn't have been there back then. But there was a series of buildings that could have had some lights along the edge there to the right. But the, I'm panning down where that accident happened. You see that garage door? Well, that wasn't there then. So this area probably would have been as dark or darker. This is. Right now, I'm, I'm panned out all the way. This is where this train comes around the bend by Barn Bluff, so it's, it's pretty dark. So I don't know if that makes things better or worse. I know that uh, there was some signal confusion that uh, caused the accident. So did this help it on or, or did it make things worse? Who can say? but I needed to see what this looks like. It is 6.35 right now. So real quick, I'm looking across the river. That's the Mississippi River. On the other side of that river is Wisconsin. You might think I'm looking east because Wisconsin is east of Minnesota, but because of the bend in the river and the way Red Wing is situated, we're actually looking mostly north. So if I pan around this way, this is west. And just about at, the, at that bend is where I did make a video of the Hiawatha derailment, if you remember that one. Now I'll pan around to the east. I'm trying not to make you dizzy. The wife says I do this too fast all the time. So this is east. And this is what's gonna play out. There's gonna be a train coming from the east. So coming from that direction, heading west, that would be towards where I'm standing. It's coming up the tracks this way. And there's a siding here where this train is gonna sideswipe another train that's coming off of the siding. Now that's the short of it, but I just wanted to Mention it as we look for the spot where this really happened. So I've moved down east of the depot. And if you look over here, you'll see that Red Wing Ironworks building. That was there at the time. This is uh, Bush Street. That's the Red Wing parking area there. And, uh, that was not there back in 1945. And there was, a, there was a series of mills. This is your milling district back then. So there were buildings here that went out and kind of lined up with what you see is back there. 
So that was kind of a solid line of milling buildings that came down this way here. This whole area was switches, sidings, all kinds of things were going on out here. Spurs. And I want to note this building here because this building here, see this brick building and I'll get another view of it later. That building we're going to use because this happened just about out in front of that building. So that's kind of one of our, our points in this video to see what was going on. And that building over there, that building was not there, okay? I know you're looking at it and you're gonna say, Tony, but it's there. And I'm telling you, no, that was not there in 1945. But there was a building there. And that was the storage building for the, uh, for the boats that came up the river. So I'm going to show you a map right now. I want you to note where that building, that brick building is on the map. And note where that boathouse is on the map. But I don't want you to pay too much attention to where the switch is that's on that map because I think that fellow probably drew the switch in just about a wrong place. And note the end of Levy Park. So while you're looking at that map, and I'll put up two. One will be just with the tracks, and then I'll write on the second one so you can see whereabouts everything was. This way we can get the feel and know where we're at. And while you look at that map, I'll head over and walk down to the end of Lovey Park so we can look at something else. Well, if you looked at the maps, you know where the end of Lovey Park is and I'm standing at the end today, and I don't think that the park has changed much as far as the amount of land it sits on. So, if you looked at the siding and the switch, on, on that map it shows it coming past the park a little bit before, before you see the, the switch where the siding comes in. In fact, there's a switch here now that I see back here. I don't know if you can see the little sign there on it. But I don't believe that's the one that was here in 1945 because I have a picture that shows that switch right out in front of the old Red Wing Milling Company building and that's that red brick building that you see right there. And if you took note on that map and saw the old uh, boat storage building. That's pretty much right across from that building and that's probably right where you see those, those kind of creamy looking towers. I'll bet that's where that building was. You look at that picture, I'll put it up in a few minutes. And we're gonna go with that picture on where that switch was. So that switch would have been right out here. You see, there's this train signal that's right here now. I think it probably would have been somewhere right about in that area. So that's about where that switch, where the siding met up with the main line. And there were two main lines at that time going through this area. So I'm gonna say that this accident probably started right here, but because of the force of the accident, this whole area for the next couple hundred feet here was just loaded with mangled boxcars. Now, this is that building, remember, I said it's not here. You're looking at it, but it's not here. And right about, see those twin towers there? You can see the rooftop of the old Red Wing Milling building 
to the right, off to the right up there. I believe that's where that boathouse was sitting, right about there. But I'm gonna put up that picture right now so you can see where that was. So now we've kind of set the stage. You know where the siding came into the main line where the switch was. And while we're here, did you see that telephone pole up there? <laughs> that telephone pole, look at the insulators. I talked to an insulator collector at one time. Do you know that telephone pole goes back to the Milwaukee road days? I don't know, it might be the oldest telephone pole in Red Wing. Yep, telegraph wires used to run on that pole. So I'm back here at this uh, ADM fence. And I uh, certainly can't go walking into a rail yard. So we're going to do this from here. And I'll try to keep my camera as steady as I can on a zoom. In fact, maybe I can set it on this fence post. So let's zoom in. You can see that building there. And you can see those towers. So right about there, out in front there, is where that switch was on the main line. Remember, there were two main lines here. Probably, probably the, the well, the rail tracks alongside that hopper there between that and that building. It's, that's the main line, and I'm thinking years ago, the second main line would have been where this hopper is. But what I want you to see is, from where this happened, so right there, just about where that building is, is where this accident happened. But check out the tracks in the distance. See how it's bending? That's bending around to go around Barn Bluff. Right there. So it's bending, it's going around, it's going around Barn Bluff. It's 6.35 in the morning, it's dark. It's, it's really dark. It's overcast days, similar to what it is today. And that, he's coming around that corner and he, ha he has the green light. He's, he's barreling down the tracks, man. He's getting his way to St. Paul. He's coming from Chicago. And all of a sudden, here's this other train entering the main line from the siding. And it was a double header, so it was, it was two engines that were going to pull the load off of that siding. And, and both of those engines were manned. They had full crews. And just as the first engine pulls out onto the siding, the train heading towards St. Paul, coming from the east, heading west, slams into it. And from that point, about 200 feet up the track towards where I'm at, towards where I'm at, is just riddled with engines and boxcars, and these boxcars are just torn apart. So the engineer that was in the front locomotive, because there were two, it's a double header, means two locomotives, and they were manned. The engineer in the front locomotive, he's killed. He, he dies uh, almost instantly of, of burns and other injuries. And six others are, are brought up to uh, St. John's Hospital in Red Wing. And then well, around 10 o'clock in the morning. So that's, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. About 10 o'clock in the morning. The embers from one of the engines starts a fire. And Red Wing Fire Department's called and comes down and puts out the fire. The whole area was blocked all day long. But Milwaukee Road sent their equipment up here to work on it right away. And by midnight that night, they had a main line cleared.
But during the day, all the trains were transferred over to the Burlington Railroad that's over on the other side of the Mississippi River on the Wisconsin side. And by the end of the next day, all the mangled tracks had been repaired, everything had been moved, and the railroad was back up and running again. And when I put up this picture, it's unbelievable how they could clear that mess up in just like two days. Unbelievable. But that's what the paper said. I'll put up some clippings of the newspaper too. The train heading towards St. Paul, coming from the east, heading west, slams into it. And from that point, about 200 feet up the track towards where I'm at, towards where I'm at, it's just riddled with engines and boxcars, and these boxcars are just torn apart. Uh, it's cold out there. It's not as cold as the day that accident happened, though. But cold enough. If you were here, I'd give you a cup of coffee. Some wine guy brought it up from Columbia on his mule or his donkey or something. It's really good coffee. Anyway, just to recap, we've got that train coming up on the main line heading west. We've got another train on the siding. Train on the siding's pulling out onto the main line. The other train coming up the main line slams into the side of it. And that's what makes the carnage in that photo behind me. I don't know, you look at that and that's a lot of wreckage, boy. And the newspaper said that the train on the main line was traveling about 25 miles an hour. So, I don't know, when I sit out to depot today, those trains are going a lot faster than 25 miles an hour. I'll bet they're going all of about 50 miles an hour when they go through there. So maybe 25, I don't know what the speed limit was back then through there. These are steam engines, so, but even they could go at pretty good clips. Wound up being uh, three, three steam engines and 11 cars in that accident that were mangled up pretty good. Then, like I said, there was a fire at uh, about 10 o'clock, and Red Wing Fire Department put it out. Police chief said he never saw a crash that big in his life. And then they were worried about hobos because they wanted to clean the mess up as soon as they could because... They thought hobos would bury, were buried in the wreckage, but there wasn't any hobos in there. And by, by midnight, Milwaukee Road had one of their main lines open, and by the end of the next day, they had both of them open and tracks cleaned up, and there was said to be a lot of mangled tracks that had to be repaired, and they did all of that work the next day, and just amazing how fast they got it open. Anyway, I hope you... Uh, you like that video? I, I, I like all kinds of railroad history. I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that somebody died in that one, that's for sure. And, rail, you know, when we talk about railroad accidents, Red Wing's got a history of them, too. Yeah, there's probably five of them off the top of my head I could think about. And this one happened in 45, and three years before this, there was, a, there was another crash that happened down closer to where the 
the kiln is. You know the kiln that's in the beginning of my videos when the train goes by the kiln? Yeah, right down there in that area there was another one where an engine ran into a caboose. Don't ask me how. One stopped on the line and bam! Another one ran into the caboose and killed the brakeman. So I don't know how they rate what could be the worst accident, you know, but you had one one death and, and six injured in this one, so maybe that's why they say that's the worst one that ever happened in Red Wing. I don't know. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll have a few more coming up in the works. and You guys take care. God bless you all. And hey, whether you're watching this on MeWe or, or uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Give me a like. I'd appreciate it. And subscribe. Thanks.